Welcome back, honors. Uh, today we're gonna well this weekend actually because you know like I'm trying my best to get these things uploaded before I ever leave school. Sometimes on the weekends I'll depend on a Sunday, but I'm, this year I'm gonna try my best not to. Okay, so. Today we started talking about ancient Egypt, right? So we talked about their geography and how they're actually located in northern Africa, which some people don't even know. Uh, their arid temperatures, uh, silt, how they were full of life, how Herodotus thought it was so easy for them to farm, the uni unification of their kingdoms, nya, 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 and here we go. All right, so this is where we actually stopped, okay? Um, so... We started talking about uh, Menes and how he united Upper and Lower Egypt, creating one gigantic centralized government, right? Which is very, very important because we today actually in the United States use a centralized government. And, oh, that's a little too low. All right, so following the unifications of the kingdoms, though, Egypt ado adopted dynastic rule, all right? Now, does anybody know what dynasty is without looking at this? Good job, Matthew. Uh, it's actually a ruling family, right? It is a ruling line of families, and this differed from Mesopotamia as Nebuchadnezzar and Hammurabi were actually military leaders, right? So many Mesopotamians, mainly the Babylonians, believed that generals and warriors should be in charge, whereas Egyptians believed that families should rule together until they're deposed, right? And we'll talk about that how, how that works in with the ideas of Mott and the universe and justification of rebellions under Egyptian life later on. So, also, they had a very, very, very intense religion and mythology. Now, some of you are asking, why did I go from government to religion and mythology? That'll make a lot of sense here in a little bit, okay? So, early on in Egyptian mythology, there are two gods, right? There is Amon, which is the wise god king of the sky, and then there was Ra, who is the justified taker of life and the god of the sun. Now, Horus was the falcon god of the hunt and war and also the messenger of Ra. He bestowed the ability upon the pharaohs so they could actually rule. Now, excuse me, of course as time progresses, mythology evolves, right? It grows because why are people so dependent on mythology? We talked about this the other day, right? when, of course, people are going to look at a flood and believe that God is angry. Mythology is necessary because it gives ancient civilizations the ability to be able to explain rational, everyday occurrences in the absence of science, right? So it, it makes a lot more sense that way for them to, under, to wrap their minds around, right? Because to them, the ideas of atoms, physics, uh, low pressure systems, higher temperatures, the greenhouse effect is not really a thing in their peripheral scope, right? So remember, mythology is used to replace science. But like I was saying, early on we had three gods, right? It was Amun, Ra, and Horus, okay? And Horus was the guy that actually led, as you can see here, pharaohs to their ability to lead, right? Now, can somebody tell me where do we see the unification of e Upper and Lower Egypt in this mythological, uh, uh, in this mythological piece of pap papyrus right here? Right there. That's exactly right, Olivia. Very, very good. So as you can see, the upper and lower kingdom crowns have been united, so you know that this is following Menes, right? So let's keep going, though. Now later on, as their mythology progresses, uh, priests are going to actually take Amun and Ra and combine them into the one supreme god. Now let's think about that real quick. If you're in Egypt and you look around, what do you think the supreme being is, given their environment? I mean, we're talking average days of 108. Yeah, exactly. Good job, Darren. So they believed that the sun was actually a god. They believed Amun-Ra, which was a formless uh, god. He was believed to embody himself as anything at any time, but he was most often seen as coming back as a ram, as we talked about with Abraham and how those two things kind of related and cross paths, right? So represented the symbol as the all-seeing eye, right? This is Amun-Ra's main symbol, the belief that he can see everything, the belief that he is omnipotent, right? Which actually shares a lot of commonality traits with different, uh, with different religions believing that their God is all-powerful, all-seeing, all-knowing, all of those things, right? Ironically enough, it mirrors almost identically with the Jewish faith. We're going to get more into that later, okay? So, and then their mythology just continues to grow, right? It continues to grow and explain everyday occurrences like 
what happens to us when we die because we human beings really, really struggle with uh, the idea of death and where we're going to be going. So just like the Egyptians did. So they came up with a way to explain it, right? Now, Osiris was the god of the Nile and of fertility as well, but a very lesser known fertility god. Now, let's talk about the Osiris story real quick. So Osiris is believed to be the god of the underworld because he actually had a brother. Now, this is, again, their mythology is growing and starting to include more characters, right? Now, Osiris was formerly a pharaoh. And the belief was that he had a brother named Set, right? And Set was kind of like our god of evil, our Hades, our god of misdoings and things that are wrong, right? So uh, Osiris actually was married to Isis, who is the goddess of res resurrection. Now, what happened is, though, Set's going to throw a big party for Osiris to celebrate his uh, rule and all those things. Well, funny enough, Set was up to something the whole time because he wanted to rule over Egypt instead of Osiris. So he had a sarcophagus built for him, which we know is a large coffin ornamented with uh, gold and other things like that for the wealthy. Now, he had a sarcophagus built for him, and after Osiris had had a little bit too much of a good time, he said, why don't you step in to the sarcophagus? See if it fits you. Osiris gets inside of it, set, slams the door shut, and then throws him into the Nile to drown. Also, apparently, he was cut up into pieces and then sprinkled into the Nile as well. Now, Isis then went into the Nile at night, found all of Osiris' pieces, reassembled him, and Osiris became the king of the, or the god of the Nile upon his resurrection, and also the god of judgment in the underworld. So there was always feuding tensions between Set and Osiris in Egyptian mythology. So, she is believed to bring Osiris back to life, Isis is, uh, every single year when the Nile what? When it floods, right? Because remember, Egyptians view the Nile as a gift, whereas Mesopotamians do what with their river? Good job, Peter. They fear it, right? So, I'm not going to make you watch that movie right now. We'll watch it on Monday. So, anyway, now, Egyptians in the afterlife. So, to explain their perspective on afterlife, now, look, see, it's just growing and growing. The mythological perspectives are just expanding, expanding, expanding. It'll explain everything about their life, right? Their religion is growing at a rapid rate, while the government is kind of still staying the same. Now, Anubis was considered the usherer of the dead and the god of mummification, right? All what we would call kind of your angel of death, right? Now, you had the head of a jackal, and he was believed to take you from the ethereal plane, which is here on Earth, down into the underworld to be judged by Osiris, right? All of the ideas about the afterlife are actually recorded in a very big text that's real. It's called the Book of the Dead, right? And down here, you can see how Egyptians believe that their soul was judged, right? So down here, you can see Anubis, right, with the soul itself, bringing him over. That's his heart, and it's actually being weighed next to the feather of truth. Now, this guy right here is Atoll, and that is actually Osiris's pet crocodile, lion, hippopotamus thing that will actually eat your soul if it is too heavy of sin, right? So, this right here is Toth, and he is actually the recorder and the god of writing and hieroglyphics. And then, if you passed, Horus brought you over to the presence of Osiris, who decided whether or not that you were going to be consumed by Atoll or move on to the happy field of food, right? Judgment. A lot of common or a lot of religions have commonalities between them but we'll talk about that again later on monday so bam bam there's osiris and isis right there judging the souls deeming, deeming them whether or not they're able to go to the afterlife so other egyptian gods and goddesses that i really like a lot because i think they're very interesting uh kanum is really cool he's this guy right here he's the ram-headed god he's actually the creator of people uh they couldn't explain pregnancy in egyptian society so what they believed with your soul was, is actually Kanum right here built you out of clay and then placed you in your mother's stomach, which I always thought was kind of cool. And then we have Toth, who's the god of balance and intelligence. He's the writer. He's also the god of hieroglyphics and writing and uh, recording and uh, all of that good stuff. And then cats were believed to be the guardians of the underworld. That's why pharaohs always kept them so close. And then my favorite one, though, is Bess, and he is the dwarf god. Okay, so here are some, oh, actually, this is really cool. These are some mummified cats of Pharaoh Ramses II, and I always thought that was really neat. And this is actually one of the Egyptians' pet crocodiles that was also mummified. But this right here is Bess. So Bess is the only god to be shown full face instead of profile, right? And Bess is believed to be the god of mischief, good childbirth, and then also having a good time. He's like the god of partying, right? So anyway, it's really, really funny, though, because if anything ever broke in your house... People used to blame it on Bess. Like, Bess is just running around. He's hiding in here. And he was believed to, like, hide in your home and chase away demons if you were pregnant for a good childbirth. So, as you can see, the Egyptian mythological structure is vast, right? And it has grown. So, do you think that the Egyptians would then eventually 
tie their government and their mythology together, that's where you'd be right. And they created this phenomenal thing that really kept them going a lot, and the idea that the god king, right? Theocracy. Theocracy is a very, very important term. It's a government that is backed by religious ideals. So people in the Egyptian kingdoms actually looked to the pharaoh as an embodiment of God, right? As a piece of Amun-Ra, as Amun-Ra himself in a way, right? They believed that pharaohs were blessed to rule by the gods and they were considered a living god on earth. So we're going to talk about how this is then reflected in their architecture, in their time periods, in their anything and everything as we continue, especially with Mott, which is their universal force and binding ideas of like good and evil, okay? So, oh, as you can see, the main ling or lingering thing we wanted to learn from this today is the fact that Egyptian religion and mythology was so expansive that it actually even began to tie into their government, right? So, this is all for the weekend, and I hope you all really enjoyed it, and I look forward to seeing you. And if you want to, look up some Egyptian mythology and come in and talk about it on Monday, all right? Y'all have a good weekend.